thank you, Irina. Thank you for this opportunity to moderate this uh, very important event. Good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear judges, your honors. Today, uh, we have a rare opportunity to talk to a world-renowned uh, psychologist, psychiatrist, uh, um, Dr. Saleh Dumat. We have to remember one thing. This meeting uh, was made possible uh, thanks to the effort of Justice for All activity um, of USAID. This webinar is very important. Ukraine is going through hard times, uh, uh, martial law, people um, experience stress, behave differently. It's uh, hard to communicate, but we need we need to stay strong our country needs to be proud of its citizens and um, therefore today we'll be listening to recommendations from dr salak dumak on how to care about yourself under this dire circumstances that we're experiencing on the territory of our Ukraine, temporary circumstances. Our webinar is on self-care, stress management, resilience. It is uh, uh, co-hosted by the National School of Judges with support of Justice for All, USA Justice for All activity. I would like to give the floor to the rector of the National School of Judges, Mr. Mikola Onishchuk. Good afternoon, dear participants of the webinar. Uh, you know, we already using this phrase, good afternoon. In early days into uh, the full-scale invasions, we had to work up the courage to say that the afternoon is good. It was very hard for us to utter the very word good. Fortunately, today, uh, we feel more open, more confident uh, with uh, the war events in the back of our uh, mind. Nonetheless, jointly with the USA Justice for All activity, we were able to organize this very important webinar on uh, psychological support to uh, the public, to judges, to court staff, uh, everyone who is part of a very important Im function of uh, the country, administering justice in this uh, uh, dire circumstances. Mr. Klina has already mentioned that uh, um, an esteemed uh, specialist, uh, uh, psychologist and psychiatrist uh, uh, is uh, conducting this event. He's a licensed psychiatrist, Dr. Salah Dumat, and I hope that his participation and his uh, ideas, professional experience about uh, uh, self-care and care for judges and uh, court staff will be very valuable. A lot of people, uh, several hundreds registered for the meeting, which suggests that they find the topic significant and very important. The topic of uh, psychological resilience and stress management um, from the very, very early days uh, of the war, was very important for the National School of Judges. And today we have an opportunity to listen to professional advice and recommendations from uh, um, respected uh, uh, specialists in the area of psychology and psychiatry, Dr. Saleh Dumat. And actually, it's a pleasure that our expert is from the UK. UK was one of the first countries uh, 
to provide Ukraine with not only psychological support, but military financial aid to Ukraine in Ukraine's fight against aggression. And I would like to thank uh, uh, the entire British nation represented by Dr. Salah Dumit for their invaluable support to Ukraine and Ukrainian nation. The list uh, of... Uh, uh, Dr. Dumas' accomplishments uh, and achievements is three pages long. Uh, he is very experienced and uh, professional. Um, I would like uh, to give the floor to Ms. Shuklina uh, now, and uh, I'd like to wish uh, all of the participants to have a productive meeting helpful meeting and uh, practical. The best of success to you. I'm convinced this seminar, similar to uh, other seminars that we uh, had with our American colleagues, are just as usual, timely and helpful. Uh, Natalia, we have two Natalias here. You meant me, the moderator, yes. But either way, it's great. If you take the floor, or Ms. Natalia Petrova, I would like to give the floor to Natalia Petrova, Deputy Chief of Party of USA uh, Justice for All Activity. Thank you very much, uh, Natalia. Natalia Georgievna, uh, uh, patronymic, just to tell one Natalia from another. It's such a pleasure to see so many people, 247. It's such a pleasure to see that people are interested in the topic. And even though we are meeting online, it's such a pleasure to see all of you safe, healthy, and relatively calm, relatively relaxed. This morning, I was thinking to myself, it's eight weeks since the enemy invaded our lives. It is hard, but we need to stay strong. We believe in our armed forces. We know that we will win. Every day, those of us who left our homes, we are waiting for the time when we will be able to return. And for those who stayed, it's important to listen to the seminar because the war will be over sooner or later. But as Natalia put it, we need to care for ourselves. We need to make sure we're, the, we're there when peace comes, that we are there for our families. So it's such a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Salah Dumat, our um, respected expert. He agreed. Uh, to conduct a lecture. Uh, he actually worked with us. Uh, we had a similar uh, webinar with him for our team. And uh, it was such a pleasure um, to, to hear that he agreed to work with our lawyers, judges, court staff. He has unique experience. He's both a psychiatrist and psychologist. Uh, he has uh, counseling experience working with uh, families, with children, with adults, with children. Immense experience uh, in the area of stress management. Today, uh, I'm convinced each of us will uh, hear helpful professional ideas, explanations about the new reality that we found ourselves in, the so-called new normalcy. And we will hear about how to handle it. I will not take too much time. Stay safe, be healthy, and uh, wait for the victory day. It will come over to Natalia Shuklin and uh, enjoy the uh, Easter holidays uh, this weekend. Uh, you said 246 participants. 
and these include uh, local courts, cassation courts, justices, Supreme Court justices, high anti-corruption court judges, judicial assistants, uh, court staff, trainers of the National School of Judges, and uh, other employees of the National School of Judges. And now it's a very important part of our event. I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Salak Dumad. Let me bring your attention to our chat. Uh, you can find uh, uh, doctor's bio there. <clears throat> it was sent. Dr. Salak Dumad is a consultant psychiatrist, uh, uh, therapist, works in the UK. Uh, he's also a research fellow in uh, uh, George Washington uh, uh, University. Um, Dr. Dumat kindly agreed uh, to meet with the psychologist of the National School of Judges. I attended this meeting as well. And uh, Court president of the Karpatia Court, Ms. Fazigosh, was also present. This meeting was held to identify the issues that are of concern for Ukrainian people, uh, for the judicial community, in particular with relation to uh, stress resilience. And uh, Judge Fazigosh uh, shared most relevant issues that we will be discussing today. We're looking forward to Dr. Dumat's uh, recommendations about uh, the situation that we're in. We also asked Dr. Dumat uh, to explain how to talk to children about war um, unraveling in country because uh, uh, they are more vulnerable and we need to protect them. We need to make sure they stay healthy. So we asked Dr. Duma to explain how to talk to them. And now it's my pleasure to hand the floor over to Dr. Salak Duma. Over to you. We're really looking forward to um, listen to your lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Natalia. Honorable judges, facilitators, and organizers of this webinar, good afternoon. And I would like to say good afternoon, afternoon. and I will, um, this afternoon and every afternoon will be good for Ukraine. And Ukraine is a very resilient nation and will survive it. Um, I would like to say, I have a, Ukraine has a special meaning to me and a special place in my heart. Uh, my wife is Ukrainian, so you can see how close I am to Ukraine. So this is a, a very special program. Uh, this is a very special talk. I see it talking to my wider family. So um, I'm very pleased and very happy to, to be with you today. And I would uh, like to talk about stress, as you know from the introductions. Um, the talk today uh, if we can start the slides, please. Thank you, Andrew. So uh, next slide, please. The objectives of this uh, meeting. We all been through stressful situations and stress is part of our life. So today we wanna understand what exactly it means when we talk about stress. What does it mean to us? What does it mean to our minds, to our bodies? And of course, at different times, our mind and body would react differently. And now we're talking about a very, very difficult times your, uh, Ukraine is going through. Therefore, stress is really very relevant now. Although it's relevant at any part of our life, but this is a special because it's a, a very difficult time and our reactions will be different from our reactions before the war. So we're gonna talk about understand stress and also to understand if we don't manage it, if we don't deal with it in the right way, what will happen to us? 
it will happen something we don't want to happen, which is burnout. We're going to talk about burnout. We're going to talk about how we can prevent it. The war is now over two months. So it is becoming chronic, it's repetitive. And on top of that, there will be different incidents where stress becomes higher. There's a baseline stress, which is the changes through the war situation. And then the, the specific stresses for each individual will be different. So this is um, very important to understand how we react to it physiologically, how are our body, what sort of hormones will be released, how can I manage it? How can I maintain my resilience throughout this time? It doesn't matter how long it lasts. What matters is how I react to it as an individual. And then when we know the best way of interacting with all these stressful events and doing the right thing, we will be resilient. So when it's over, we're not breaking down. And that's the key, which I'm hope, I hope with this presentation, we take some tips can help us, help every one of you to manage that stress through this difficult time and uh, with, with high level of resilience and prevent burnout and prevent a breakdown. Uh, next slide, please. So when, when we talk about stress, the word comes with a negative meaning. So people, when they talk about stress, talk about something as if it's negative. But scientifically, stress is important. It's very important for us to do the work we do every day. We're listening to the webinar now. There's a level of stress required for us to be able to understand, concentrate, and process the information. So that level of stress is the good, we call it, let's make it simple by saying is a good stress. It's a stress can make us perform every day, go to work, drive a car, talk to our colleagues, doing the normal things which we need for our survival. This is all through a level of stress, which is very important, and we do not want that stress to go. However, there are times where stress becomes very harmful. And this is what we need to understand, when it's going to be harmful. And when it is harmful, what do we need to do? to reverse back to the good stress, reverse back to the normal level of stress, which is not, it's useful for us. Next slide, please. So let's talk about what is stress? Stress, the body and mind respond, respond to demands, demands things which we need to do every day. These are the demands, could be mental demands. Like, you know, I, I think too much about something. I'm worried about situation. Uh, I need to do a lot of things which require a lot of mental work, like thinking about it. Could be physical demands. If I am ill today, the demands on my body becomes more than when I am fully healthy. It could be spiritual demands, you know. Uh, could be work-related, overwork or uh, change in the work environment or moving from one area to another, or not working at all. Sometimes it could be really, really stressful because you have a role, you have a duty which you want to do. If you are displaced from one area to another and your role now is limited, this would create a lot of demands mentally because of that situation. Or you could be in a place, in the same place, but the area kind of in a, in a hot conflict area where you're not doing your job as you used to do before. This is also a very stressful situation. So all these demands on the body and the mind create a level of stress, means the mind want to resolve it. There are problems going on around us. So the mind need to think about it and I need to make solutions. I need to find a way out of it. Sometimes there is a way, sometimes there isn't, but most of the time we get really, really worried about something without focusing about what is actually I can do what is that cannot do? And then the emotions come in from the area where I cannot do it, then I need to manage it differently. And this is something we're gonna talk about more uh, in this presentation. So when is it, uh, when citrus B becomes harmful? If it's too long, if my body and mind reacting too much, 
on too long, this is not good because we are not designed physiologically as a human being and mentally we're not designed to feel stressed for a long time. And we're going to talk about the physiology of that, like the, how the body, the hormones and everything else going with it. If it's too often, happens a lot of stressful situation happen all the time, or it's too severe, a shock, something really stressful happens to me or to the people around me. Then if we go through, if the stress changes from the normal stress to too often, too long, too severe, then this is time now to stop and think, what do I need to do to save my mind and my body from that high level of stress? And this is what we, all this talk is really about these techniques to help us to recognize first when we are highly stressed. And then what do we need to do to reverse back? If we think of high stress as a red zone, if I am in the red zone, if I stay in the red zone and exposed to high level of stress, then the I know it's going to be either breakdown, burnout, and exhaustion. So how can I go back to the green zone, which is the zone where stress is managed properly and it is helpful rather than harmful? It doesn't matter. The situation might remain outside the same, but how I react to it is what matters. What do I need to do to maintain my physical and mental well-being? Uh, next slide, please. So in simple sort of diagram, stress is, is the balance, the healthy stress, the balance between resources and demands. Resources is our abilities, our you know, help we get to deal with the challenges we face. So the more challenges, we need more help. Uh, if we have less help, then we need to reduce the demands on us whether work, whether commitments, whether financial issues, whether safety. So all these things, for example, if you are in a, an area which is not safe, then you will, that will create a level of stress in you. Your mind is telling you, I'm going to keep you worried until you get out of this place and go to place of safety. If you remain in that area, then that thought will not stop unless you feel safe. And this is designed to protect us. But of course, if you stay in that area for a long time and you're not managing at this level of stress and there is nothing else you can do, you might end up breaking down and having burnout. So therefore, to maintain your well-being, physical and mental, we need to do certain things to maintain that, even though I'm still in an area which is not 100% safe. But as far as... I need my mental and physical well-being to be in the best possible shape. When the time comes to ensure my safety, I will be ready, not breaking down. And this is also part of what we talk about is how to maintain this resilience through difficult times. We might not be able to change the situation around us, but we can change how we react to it. Next slide, please. This is slide... Um, the honorable judges and, and all, everyone really works uh, require a level of um, clarity in thinking to perform the best, particularly when your decisions can have a really a huge impact on, on your work, on, on the people you are serving, basically. So high level of stress, if you look at the diagram on the right-hand side, Performance. We, any performance, whether you're driving a car or making a decision in court or making a decision about what, what you should do with your family, whether to, to leave or to stay, all these decisions require a level of stress just enough to get you the best mental capacity to make that decision. When stress is higher, our performance will drop. And this is a physiological, this is not, really doesn't depend on the person. If you are on a high level of stress and you're acting to it, then you, your mind will be completely different. And therefore, your judgment will be different. Your performance will be different. And this is why it's very important if we are at a high level of stress, not to make without, we need to manage it first to reduce it to the level of stress, which is 
helpful and get us the best performance. As you can see in this um, graph in front of you, the best performance is when you have a midway like a level of stress. But when stress is higher, your performance will drop. So awareness of the level of stress is very important. If I don't know whether I am stressed or not, if I don't know whether my level of stress is high or not, and then I start making decisions, my decisions will not be good ones. And I will probably regret it later on. So being aware of the level of stress is extremely important. Then the minute you realize you can read the signs and symptoms of high level of stress, we're gonna talk about it in a minute. And you say, okay, am I highly stressed? If the answer is yes, I can see that. I can check my symptoms. I can see it from the way I am interacting with others from the, my level of concentration, then I'm not gonna make, I need a break. I need to do certain things to get me back to the right or the green level of stress where I have, have the best mental capacity to make all these decisions. At the same time, if you look at the other graph, which is a relationship between stress and illness, you might be surprised to know if you are not stressed at all, you'll be more ill. So that's something, so this is why there's a, a level of stress is so important even for our health. But if it's too much, then our health will drop. So too little and too much stress, both not good for health. We need that level of stress, which is in the middle to give us the best performance and the best health. Next slide, please. Uh, types of stress. Stress could be, we call it acute stress, or could be chronic. Acute stress, something happens now, and I will react to it. Could be directly happening to me. Let's say what's happening now in, in real life for people who are involved in the war. You could have an accident yourself. It could be, um, you know, faced with, with violence or traveling through a very highly sort of dangerous area. All this immediate level of stress, or you hear, you talk to a, a member of your family is, is, is affected seriously in this war or car accident, all these immediate will create acute stress, I mean, we will react to it. And this is, of course, a natural reaction. What we don't want to do, we need to know what is normal for us and what is abnormal and when actually we need to seek help. So acute level of stress could be directly affecting me or could be indirect, like I hear about it. And this is really important at this time. The secondary trauma happens from things like watching TV, social media, uh, graphic, visually sort of uh, distressing videos. And unfortunately, in times of war, this is a very, very common. And this is very important to be aware of because this will create exactly the same physiological and mental reaction as if you are actually living it yourself. So don't underestimate that influx of media coverage is extremely harmful because the mind will read it as extremely threatening news and will react to it as so. So therefore, it could have a complete illness like post-traumatic stress disorder. And I've seen so many people, they are not really anywhere near the war zone. They are from a different country. And just by watching the news, watching social media, they've got post-traumatic stress disorder. This is a well, well-established diagnosis. They have nightmares, flashbacks. They cannot go out. They avoid people. This is all from only watching the news. Therefore, please take care of that. Make sure this is something part of our strategy we're gonna talk about uh, because it will create exactly the same trauma as somebody is living 
the same incident. And now we come to the next stress, which is the chronic stress. The chronic stress is piles up very slowly. It could be if you are in a job, the job is very stressful for a long time, then gradual, you don't feel it as the acute stress, you immediately know yourself you're stressed. This is a very gradual and build up. I mean, at times of war, from my scene, wars drag longer, like it doesn't end quickly. And, and I very rarely you see war ends quickly anyway. That's just the nature of and conflict. You know, war, I'm not mean just the action of war. War and the aftermath of war is a long process. It's not an event can end. This is why everyone needs to be mindful of that. Then you can do the right things throughout this time and what comes after as well, to be prepared mentally and physically. This is, a, is gonna create a long and gradual a chronic stress. And chronic stress is extremely harmful. And we're gonna talk about the harm in a minute. So um, now I'm gonna explain from a physiological point, what happens when we are acutely stressed? Like if we are faced with danger, what do we do? What happens to our body? What happens to our mind? Next slide, please. You can see from this uh, picture, you have a lion and you have a zebra. One is running away, the other one is chasing. This is what we call fight and flight response. This is a, we can call it a software. All sort of creatures have it, and we have that software as well. And this software stayed with us thousands of years and evolved and stayed. We still have it. We have it now because it's so important for our survival. We cannot survive without it. It's the alarm system in our body telling us we are at risk and we need to fight it or run away from it, how to protect ourselves. So this is an evolutionary survival system. It's a normal and natural system. It is an important system for us. And it's a physiological reaction. So this one is, uh, happens, we all, I think every one of us has been scared at some point in their life or more often, depends on the nature of the work and places where you are. And, and that trigger of scare trigger the same system as the fight and flight response in our body. And whenever, when it is triggered, uh, next slide, please. So I'm gonna explain in this slide, the process of the fight and flight response, or we call it stress response. When we are stressed, this one is, is if we think of immediate danger, like something's happening now, for example, fire or explosion or physically threatened by something, the mind will read the data. So the mind works by analyzing data. We receive the data through our senses, visual, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. This is how we receive data. So all the data when we receive it will be analyzed in the mind very quickly, fraction of seconds. And that analysis will create meanings. What does it mean? So if I hear a fire alarm, the fire alarm goes off, then my mind knows fire alarm is linked to fire. Maybe there is a fire. Same time, if I smell something burning, that meaning of fire will increase. If I hear people screaming, then I got more data. This data give me uh, a, a, another meaning like it is serious now. It is not just a, a fire alarm. There's something going on, means, the, means dangerous. So fire means danger. The minute I, my mind reaches this conclusion, as you can see in the slide, the meaning, 
And if the meaning is danger, there is one area in the brain called the amygdala. This area is responsible for recognizing dangerous situations and reacting to it. So the minute the amygdala is activated, so if you think of the mind like this, this is, we call it the cortex. This is the primitive mind where the amygdala sits and, and it works like that. So this part, we share it with all animals. It's the part responsible for our survival, food, sex, emotions, danger, all here. This part, which is the cortex, this is responsible for everything we call it higher functions, like thinking, writing, speaking, um, you know, all, all the calculation, judgment, planning, all these higher functions, which is a human kind of uh, have a sort of special ability to do, comes on the cortex. When the amygdala is activated here because we are sensing danger or I heard the news or I've seen in my eyes, and then the meaning here you are in danger, when it's activated, takes over all the energy from the cortex. And everything really becomes the brain. This is the only area in the brain is going to be working. And what it does prepares the body. Because if my mind tell, it tells me, I am um, in danger, then my body has to react to this information. You cannot separate the two, which means I need to get you ready either to fight this danger or to run away from it. And how does that? By a connection of a neurons, neuron system, and also hormones. The most important two hormones are the adrenaline, and cortisol. And I would like you to remember this too, because really everything we're going to talk about from now on is going to be about the impact of the adrenaline and the cortisol. These two hormones at times of stress will be released. Released from a gland sits on the top of the kidneys, as you can see in the picture, called adrenal gland. We'll release the adrenaline, release cortisol to prepare the body to fight or flight. So adrenaline has a function, goes to the heart, make the heart beat very fast. Uh, the muscles become very tense because if I'm fighting, I need strong muscles. If I'm running away, I need firm muscles. So, and, so the muscles need oxygen, then the lung will start working very fast. So you be, our breathing becomes shallow and fast and you can all see it when we run we kind of start breathing very shallow and very fast so when we are frightened exactly the same way when we are fighting the same way it's the same physiological process so the adrenaline will go to the lungs the breathing becomes um, shallow and fast and shallow and fast is important because in our techniques, which is the relaxation techniques, we will reverse this later. The heart beats very fast, muscle tense. The cortisol is the other hormone, has also a very important function. The function of the cortisol is because the body has limited resources, um, some organs at the time when the stress response is activated would work harder, like the heart, the brain, the lungs, the muscles. Other parts of the body systems, they become less important. For example, the digestive system. When I am stressed and running away from danger or facing danger, I'm not gonna be eating. That's again, a survival. You're not gonna be eating while you are actually running away. So the digestive system is not important at time of when the response, the stress response activated. So what will happen to the digestive system, the body will take the resources away from the digestive system, from your stomach, your bowel, 
means less blood, uh, less nourishment, less oxygen. So that's okay if the digestive system, after if the stress after two hours, three hours will be over and you are back in safety and everything goes back to normal and resources go back to digestive system. The danger, of course, if the stress continue, if I am reacting to the level of stress for a long time, and my digestive system is deprived of all these important resources for a long time, what will happen to me? It will suffer. And then the other system will also be less important at the time of high level of stress, the stress response is the immune system. Immune system, you know, the uh, lymphatic sort of uh, system, glands, um, so there are, this system will be also deprived of resources because it's not important at the time of high level of stress. And also the protective system, the ovaries, the uterus, this will all be deprived of resources. This is okay, like I said, if you deprive this uh, important system just for one hour or two, if you are getting out of building, you back to safety is okay. Uh, but if this triggered the stress response for a long time. This is when we come to the chronic stress. Then imagine after weeks or months, your immune system is not getting enough resources. It will be gradually depleting, gradually losing its function. And uh, your digestive system, then you can't, you will have indigestion you might have ulcer, we call it citrus ulcer, specifically named citrus ulcer, because there's less resources to protect the digestive system. You have irritable bowel syndrome, you have so many other illnesses, and not to I mean, also the absorption of the nutrient, the food you eat will be much less, then your whole body will suffer. This is on the long chronic stress and a protective system it would be also problematic. So in, in women, for example, it would be very obvious the changes in the period times, the bleeding, the delay in conceiving uh, pregnancy and so on. A lot of other uh, problems can come with it. So the fight and flight response we're talking about is important, but is important if it's for a short time. The only problem is when it is too long, too severe, and too often, no, because it will compromise our physiology. It will compromise my immune system, compromise the digestive system, reproductive system, and also the load on the heart because of adrenaline. So if you have a sort of a, a heart uh, condition, it will get worse, high blood pressure, and high blood pressure can lead to stroke, can lead to um, cardiac conditions, heart attack, and so on. So this is really, we're talking about something extremely serious. And, and so I will show you in the next slide, please. In this slide, this is really, this is a scan, you know, the black box uh, of the brain. This is a scan, MRI scan of the brain. What it shows, you can see the two red spots, they actually, uh, what they did, they call it functional MRI, means they, they inject certain um, sort of dye here and goes to the active areas of the brain. This is a brain of somebody who is highly stressed, high level of emotions. If you look at it, the brain really, the cortex here is black, means not using any sugar, no activities here. All the activities on the alarm system, on the amygdala, the two amygdalas from both sides. What does that tell us? That tells us at this time, at this time when we are highly stressed, we will have problems. Everything this cortex is responsible for will be affected. So movement, memory, performance, planning, judgment, 
risk awareness. How can I make a plan to manage my the risk? Specifically in this big, very difficult time, people make big decisions. Decision about moving across very dangerous area, displacement, uh, moving out of the country, making decisions every day about leaving home and doing something. These decisions will only be will all be affected negatively if the level of stress does not come down. When you highly stress, your amygdala will be activated. Amygdala activated means the rest of the brain is not going to be functioning very well. So, and also um, um, from the mental aspect side, you can feel people feel helpless, guilty, a lot of blame, anger, depression, all these emotions will come. So this is a really important slide because really shows you when the impact of high emotions. High emotion has a huge and major impact on our thinking. And this is why we need to reduce our emotion first before we make these decisions. We need to learn how to manage these emotions every day to get the best mental capacity and physical capacity we have. Then we are, if we do that, then we are resilient. We can carry on. It doesn't matter how difficult life is or how long difficult time will last. You will be resilient to continue. You're not going to break. You're going to bend, but you don't break. And that's really what we're trying to uh, achieve in this, in this talk is, is how do we get to this point? We recognize it first. We know when you are in high emotion. And then we say, okay, I am now I can understand. I'm in high emotion, I'm stressed. I would do one, two, or three to get my stress down, then I carry on. Next slide, please. Here is a list of uh, what sort of symptoms we look for. We need to know when we are stressed. So in terms of, so you have changes in feelings, and there will be also physiological changes, physical, and also, so in the way we behave. So you might not be aware of it, but people around you, they can tell you. And I think it's very good to have people you trust. When they tell you something, please take it seriously because they know you better. And they can tell you if you are sort of behaving in a way it's different or you are your feelings all over the place. If you have any of these, this means you are at a high level of stress which means this is a warning sign. If you don't respond to it, it will go on the wrong direction, but you can always reverse it back to the normal. So in terms of feelings, sadness, fear, anger, guilt, helplessness, shame, blame, um, all these can, 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 can happen. Dreams, you can have very sort of, vivid and nightmares as well. So all these feelings can happen and I'm sure you know you all go through these and, and, and it is very common and normal, but the abnormal is if it carries on for a long time, you can feel it for a short time and then you know how to manage it, this is good. But if you do not and just leave it, then it will become lead to, of course, chronic stress and burnout. Uh, physically, we talked about high level of adrenaline and high level of cortisol. So a lot of physical health problems can be can result because of that. The first one, which is the easy noticeable is the sleep. Please ask yourself this, how many hours do you sleep a day? This is really a very good indicator, can help you. Are you sleeping after drinking alcohol or are you sleeping after taking pills or are you sleeping normally without any of that? Sleep is a very good indicator on how stressed you are. If you're sleeping your normal hours, I would say probably depends on how you slept when you are relaxed, like six or seven hours or eight, and, and the sleep is, is solid, not interrupted, no nightmares, then you are in good shape. This is a good indicator, okay? So this is a good indicator that your body is getting enough rest and you don't have much adrenaline in your, in your system because when you have a lot of adrenaline because of the thinking, because of the stress, adrenaline will not let you sleep. 
because simply if I am stressed means my mind telling me I'm in danger, sleep will be against danger. Naturally, the mind will not let you sleep if you feel you are in danger. So you need to reduce that level first, then you feel safe enough to sleep. And I mean by stress doesn't mean like danger is something out there is gonna get you, no. Danger could be stress at work, could be the mind does not really differentiate between all these, it's code system, works on code. Everything eventually end up in triggering the amygdala, the stress, uh, the alarm system. So it doesn't matter what it is, but eventually they will end up all triggered. And if it's amygdala triggered because of high level of stress, then your mind will react to it and your body will have lots of adrenaline and cortisol. And these hormones have a lot of impact on our bodies. So you feel tired, the common symptoms of uh, high level of stress, headaches. A lot of people, they have really, really bad headaches. Um, muscle pain, because that adrenaline, you can feel in your shoulders, in your back. And feeling tired, you don't really want to do something. You just feel like you just can't carry on. Your blood pressure is high. Your heart is beating fast. And, and, and you're not sleeping. Uh, in terms of behavioral symptoms, the things that affect everyday life, you, people might cry. You find, and the, you ask them, they might not know why, but they're crying. Um, relationship difficulties will start because of irritability. And, you know, you don't, you're short temper, you, you're on an edge, you can't really tolerate anymore. That can affect your relationship in, at home or with colleagues. You could be withdrawn from social life. That could be by choice or could be due to the circumstances of the war. But also sometimes you find yourself liking your own self alone. And that's also a sign there's something wrong here. Um, change in behavior. People tell you, you're different. I mean, you're not rude, for example. You're not, uh, you're always nice and polite. Now you change. This is also could be a sign of high level of stress. Uh, you might feel mistrust of people around you, like you don't trust them as you used to. This is also, remember what we said, the cortex was responsible for all these deprived of resources and that center, which the amygdala is taking over everything. So our judgment really would be very poor. The minute you recognize having any of these signs and symptoms, uh, please pay attention to your body, pay attention to your feelings and pay attention to how you behave. Because these are the indicators can help you to know whether you are on the, let's say, green zone or the amber or the red. And the minute you are able to recognize, then it will be very helpful. Next slide, please. Uh, the slide after. So to avoid burnout, uh, burnout is what I said, if we don't deal with long stress, prolonged stress, then we'll need to burn out. This is something we want to avoid. Next slide, please. I click on it to show the full. Yeah. So this is what we talked about is this is the green zone. Look at the low emotion. Our mind is working properly and we can manage everything as usual. When high emotion, our mind is completely different and we don't want to get to that level. Next, please. These are the symptoms which we talked about of high level of, of cortisol and high level of adrenaline. So pay attention to these symptoms. I already mentioned that the muscle pain, the difficulties, the uh, high level of sugar, weight gain, fatigue, anxiety, depression, all this can happen when we are exposed to high level of stress for a long time. Uh, next slide, please. This is about compassionate fatigue. This is the type of fatigue happens to us when we care too much, we don't stop. I need to care, a lot of people need me. And then you exhaust your body, you exhaust your mind, 
trying to help others. And then you then later on, you will be stressed too much and not able even to help yourself. So please be aware of that. A lot of people do that because out of goodwill, out of, you know, they want to help, but it becomes too much to them. And then it will have a completely different impact on them, on others. Next one, please. Uh, now we come to the techniques. How do I reduce my stress? The first thing is safety. Make sure you're safe. If you are unsafe anywhere, try to find the best and the safest position you can be in. So this is very important. Now we're going to come to the techniques to reduce the level of stress. Next, please. So in the body, there are two systems, nervous systems. These systems work opposite each other. One we call the parasympathetic nervous system. You can call it the brake. And the other one, the accelerated, accelerate pedal, which is the sympathetic nervous system. So the stress response is the accelerator on the car, which is the sympathetic nervous system activated. When our mind sees danger, we react to it. We are at a high level of stress. We need to deal with so many things every day. This is the sympathetic nervous system is activated. So to slow it down, we need to activate another system, which is called the parasympathetic nervous system. We call it the break. And now we're going to talk about techniques activating the break. The break means less adrenaline, less cortisol, physiologically back to normal. The body has sort of time to repair and also mentally from high level of emotion to low level of emotion means the brain has enough energy to think and plan. So this is the whole idea of doing the uh, techniques we're gonna talk about. So I have a few techniques for you here. Next slide, please. The first one is the breathing technique. The breathing technique is very easy and also it is very important and you can do it anywhere and anytime. When you feel stress, when you feel tension, or even really if you want to relax after a long day, there are three steps you need to remember here. You can sit straight, your back, your hands on your thighs. If you can do it with me as you are, wherever you are, I think it's better. And then what you need to do from your nose, you take deep deep means you push your diaphragm down to the abdomen you feel your abdomen is rising so when you reach the abdomen you hold it for three seconds one two three and then you release it from your mouth so once again If you close your eyes, it's better. Please repeat that until you get it right. And if you have a watch like this one, it tells you your heart rate, you do it before and after, and you can see your heart rate will drop. It means your adrenaline in your body dropped. Your blood pressure will drop as well. The more you do it, the better. This is a switch, can it switch the uh, stress response immediately, can it switch it off. So please uh, use this as much as you can and follow the rules. The main thing is you inhale from your mouth. It's deep, means you reach your abdomen. Lungs push the abdomen. Hold it there for a few seconds, three seconds, and then release it slowly from your mouth. Uh, next slide, please. The second important thing we can do to maintain our resilience is movement. Movement could mean exercise, but you know, I don't mean exercise like the heavy exercise going to the gym or running every day or having 
a bike, if you can do that, it's for everyone at any place, you can do it. So any movement you choose, Unfortunately, our speaker has disappeared for some reason. We will have to take a few minutes to wait for him to get back. Dr. Dumat, you are muted. Now, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you all right. You can hear me now, yeah? Yes, yes. Yes. Sorry, I had a little bit of connection problem here. So uh, going back to the movement, any movement you can do is important. As far as you move your muscles, of course, the larger muscles, the limbs muscles are very important. So walking, jogging, walking the dog, um, going up and down stairs, uh, whatever you can afford, whatever it's possible for you to do, but please do it regularly. It releases endorphin, improves the mood, and definitely improves the sleep as well. And when you do the movement, focus on the movement, not on your worries, not on the thoughts. There's no point if you are walking in a, in a, doing a walk but at the same time, you're thinking of something very stressful. That's not going to help. So always focus on, on, on the place where you walk, whether there are trees or uh, the pressure of your feet when, you, when, when you're pressing on the ground. This is all uh, will bring you to, to the now and here and now away from your worries. Uh, next slide, please. So the recommendation for exercise, this is uh, per, uh, per day, I would say not per week, because 20 minutes a day. Uh, so you can do 20 minutes every day. You can break it into five minutes each if you can, but that's the minimum really will give you the physical um, sort of uh, uh, activity which reduces your stress. It could be brisky movement, could be walking, could be swimming, could be even dancing, whatever you can. Or you could do 10 minutes of sweating type of, of, of exercise where you really work harder. 10 minutes a day will be okay enough. I think everyone can fit that into your diary and, and try to find a way to do it because this is part of your resilience. This is what makes you able to cope with stress without breaking down. It has to be regular, enjoyable, pencil it in your diary. If you can do it with a friend, even better. You can ride a bike if you can. It depends on what's available to you. You can walk a dog. Whatever you can do, please maintain at least 20 minutes a day of exercise. That will be extremely helpful to you. Next slide, please. Now, grounding techniques. Grounding techniques depends on basic principle. The mind can only focus on one thing at a time. For example, if you have two people, one on the right, the other one on the left, and they talk in the same time, the mind cannot listen to them at the same time. They either listen to one and shift to other or stay with one and leave the other because the mind can only think, focus on one thing at a time. When I'm worried and I have a lot of problems I'm thinking about, of course, while my mind is worried, Imagine your body producing adrenaline and cortisol, like engine. This is an engine working and a factory producing more adrenaline and cortisol and affecting your body. The more you think about it, the more of these hormones will be released. So you want to stop the engine. You want to give it a 
time to stop, then your body can recover, can rebuild, can repair. How do we do that? By changing focus. Grounding techniques help us to change this focus. For example, I hold this, I use touch. Grounding techniques, we use these, our senses, you know, sight, hearing, uh, taste, touch, smell, would bring us to the here and now, the present, not the, uh, the thoughts and the worries in my head. So this is hot. I hold it and then I think about the temperature and I just follow the temperature in my head. How does it change? How does it feel? These are a few seconds while I'm holding this, my mind is only engaged with this activity. It's not thinking about the worry. Therefore, my mind stopped the adrenaline, stopped the cortisol. And that time, it depends on how long I need to do this. The more I do them, the better time I give to my body to recover. The same, something cold, or sometimes you hold both and you compare the temperature. So you are engaged in this activity. So this is very important. Next slide, please. Is here and now using my senses, we call it mindfulness as well. It's a mindfulness testing. Uh, press hard while you're sitting in the office. You can press your, one of your uh, sort of feet down and then feel the tension in the muscles. And you can do it alternatively. And also focus on it. That also brings you to the here and now, brings you to the present. The problem is people either thinking on the past, what happened, or worrying about the future. And the moment, which is the only real time we have it, which is now, we lost it. We're not actually engaged in it. So these activities can help us to engage. Uh, next slide, please. Food. Very important to understand the impact of food on stress. Sugary food, sugary drinks are not good. Plenty of water, whole grain food, very important. Alcohol is not good. I know alcohol is, uh, I think uh, what I've heard is, is uh, time before is banned, but, but uh, of course, be aware of that. Too much alcohol is not good. It's not gonna help you. Uh, plenty of water you need to drink. Avoid caffeine drinks um, because they increase the, in, in, you know, they're very sensitive, make you more anxious, increase the adrenaline in the body as well. And increase vegetables and fruits. Of course, I'm talking about I know the difficulties at times, poor food could be, you can only eat in some places what you can afford, what you can have access to. And, uh, and you know, that's my heart and you know, with, with everyone who's, who's, who's actually in need of, of that. But we are talking here in, in general, whenever it's possible. And, and even if you are in an extremely difficult place, please pay attention to your health because this is what keeps you survive. And this is what you need to get over it. So be aware of your uh, high, high level of protein is very important and complex carbohydrates is very important. Like I said, her, uh, the whole grain bread. Next slide, please. I, I touched upon this earlier about limited exposure to harmful information. The mind will react to it as if it's happening now. So if I see images, if I hear the news, just Try to limit it to what is important. What is it you need? A credible source, a, a sensible source who takes over all the graphics. You don't need to know everything. And not everything you, you hear is going to be true. And you know that. Most of the news are fake news. Most of the news are, are, are uncensored. It means like three images of, of children and, and, and death. The mind cannot tolerate this. It will increase the level of stress. So please be careful with that not just you, your family, your children, make sure you know what they're seeing and try to limit exposure to the very important information which you need. I know with judges, you think you need to know everything and, and that might not be true. So try to find out what exactly you need to know and how to limit it to the most important. And if you, limit, if you have to have to listen to certain news, don't do it all the time. Do it at a specific time. Try to control that. Uh, next, please. I'm sorry, I think we're running out of for, for the break time, but uh, I think these are important slides to, to cover. Um, maintain social connection. This is also a, an extremely important resilient uh, sort of tool. 
family, friends, colleagues, whatever you can through video or calls or messages, do it. And if you can do it in person, this is even better. So whatever you can do, please do it. In connection, try to find an empathetic listener, somebody who you trust and can listen to you without judgment and available emotionally to you. If you find a person who has these um, qualities, then please maintain your relationship with, because uh, it, in most research, empathetic listeners seem to um, have been very helpful and making people sort of enhancing people's resilience. Uh, next slide, please. Click on it. Uh, keep clicking three clicks. Yeah. Right. So this slide is about where to focus. We will be overwhelmed with many things, particularly at this time of war. So there are things you control, things you can change. It's in your ability and it's in your, whether in your job or family. These are the things where if you have any emotion related to them, then do it and change it. This is fine. Then you will have things you have only influence, but you cannot change. You have no control over whether you can change it or not. You can only influence. These things also, you can try to do something about it, but don't uh, feel you are responsible for the outcome because that feeling of responsibility comes with feeling of guilt if this responsibility is not fulfilled. And therefore, a lot of people feel guilty for things they're not responsible for. So make sure you know what is your responsibility, whether it is in your control or not, then you can manage your emotion around it. And also there are things you have no control over, therefore zero responsibility, like the war. You're not responsible for starting or ending the war, like uh, major changes happen. So try one of the difficulties in people uh, at times of war is feeling of, of blame, self-blame, uh, over uh, exaggerated responsibility. This can create a lot of guilt feeling. So make sure reflect on it if you have any of that and think about it. Is it really your responsibility? Uh, next slide, please. Here we talk about gratitude. Um, of course, this is something, it, it, it sounds very simple, but actually it's very powerful. And most of the research about uh, stress management have come to this uh, sort of element of it, which is if we try to actively remember every day, three things we are grateful for. The three things could be simple things like drinking water uh, or, or having uh, access to food or talking to a friend or, or feeling you know, safe or any simple things. It doesn't matter where you are. If you find three things which you are grateful for, then this can enhance your sort of uh, uh, positive and optimistic self rather than pessimistic self and reduces the worry. Next slide, please. Uh, resilience, resilience, as uh, Charles Darwin says, it is not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent that survive. It is one that is most adaptable to change. So how do we adapt to change is the key of survival. So the more flexible you are, you're open to change and finding new ways all the time. And, and that will be a, a, a very important quality in, in resilience. Next slide, please. Uh, so resilience is not about uh, not having sort of difficulties, it's about going through difficulties, life misfortune, whether it's a war, is a relationship problem, is a job challenge, whatever it is, is accident, cancer, going through it without a breaking. You can bend, but when that difficulty is over, you go back, you maintain yourself, uh, physical and mental well-being. Uh, next slide, please. Click on, yeah. This is a, just a general wheel of health to build resilience. Try to sort of think about the aspects 
uh, sense of humor, extremely difficult at time of war when suffering is overwhelming, but we've seen it, people find it even the worst possible cases because it's important for humanity. That sense of humor is important because it is part of our resilience system. Uh, communication is very important. As we mentioned, the diet, the support of our environment around you, whether at work or, or at home, accept yourself and be flexible and open to change. A spiritual attainment, whatever your spirituality is, this gives you other meanings to life, can challenge the difficulties we're facing. Uh, we talked about exercise and movement and positive mental attitude. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, so this is a general slide about demands and uh, the uh, resources you have. If you have physical demands, like a physical illness, then you find a treatment, you find rest. So then this is how you balance it. If you have a family challenges, then you find solutions for it. If you need support at work, then try to find what is support. If it's overload, you reduce it. If it's too little work, then you try to find other ways and other meaning. So that's a, a, a list of different things, which how can we balance resources and demands? If you have more demands, then you need either you increase the resources or reduce the demands. You cannot have a lot of more demands and resources the same because you will break down. That's mentally, it's gonna be very difficult. Next slide, please. In summary, moderate stress is normal and useful. This is very important. Too much, as we said, too often and too long exposure to stress is very harmful and we need to be aware of it and need to be aware of the signs. Be aware of the signs of high level of stress and then use the stress management techniques with one we, we mentioned earlier to reduce uh, the stress. Um, be aware of your demands as resources as we mentioned in this slide to balance it. Keep an eye on it. If you have more, then look at, uh, do I have enough resources? Yes, that's fine. If I don't have enough resources, I increase my resources or no, I reduce my demands. And be aware of prolonged stress and how does it affect the body and avoid burnout. And resilient lifestyle, move, connect, limit exposure, healthy food, work sensibly and meaningfully, uh, be flexible and adaptable to change and maintain sense of humor. And um, next. Okay, well, well, thank you very much. I think uh, um, we took a little bit of your break time and uh, uh, it's up to the organizer. Do you want to break or we can move on to the next? I think uh, we should take a short break for you to rest for a little while. Um, I think take we can take 10 minutes. We took a short break to have a little rest ourselves and uh, Dr. Dimit, let's continue. Uh, our webinar with a presentation on explaining war to children. Over to you, Dr. Dumit. Thank you very much, Natalia. Thank you. Uh, first slide, please. Second one. Yeah. So uh, this talk is about children. Children are as they're a huge part of life and they're very important at times of war and any time. Uh, specifically at the time of high level of stress, we must not forget about children. Um, and particularly when they're very small, uh, the common sort of feeling for some people uh, think they don't understand and they're okay. And I can tell them they are fine and it will be fine. It, and unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. And there are ways we need to be aware of and mindful of to help children to understand what well, war is very traumatic, it's extreme uh, sort of level of, of stress for everyone, changes their place, changes their friends, changes their school, and, and so on. This is a very important uh, topic that what do we say to children at time of war? How do we talk to them? And, and, and this is uh, why we, we, we uh, sort of thought this presentation could be really uh, can give you some tips about this particular topic. So um, 
the objective is, is really how to talk to children at times war and what is the best place to talk to them and how do I understand my child like emotionally how do I read signs of distress how do I know the child is distressed or not um, and also what do I need to do to reduce that level of stress for children so there are certain activities we can do to help them out next slide please so the question is whether the children have the right to know or not. The answer is clearly yes, the children have the right to know about what's happening. And this is the responsibility of the parents or the caregiver, whoever is looking after the children, um, to provide safety and to protect children from harm. And harm here could be the false information, could be, uh, would be the level of distress they're going through because of the war. So this is the responsibility of, of people who are looking after the children to make sure they know how to protect them. And part of this is to know how to communicate with children at time or how to understand their feelings and how to react to these feelings in a healthy and helpful way to protect them from harm. And before, of course, you do that, you need to look after yourself because if you are highly stressed yourself, you'll not be able to provide the right environment for a child. So please, I will repeat that again, take care of yourself first before you take care of your children. And this is a, a really important uh, sort of uh, priority. So yourself first is not selfishness, it's self-care. So next slide, please. So before talking to a child about what's going on, or sometimes children can ask questions, there are things you need to be mindful of. Is this the right place? Am I in the right place to talk to the child? I could be in the street, I could be in a car, I could be in a shelter, I could be you know, very distressed myself. Um, is it the right time? Uh, is it the child relaxed enough now for me to give information and also how the child feeling what is his state or her state of mind at the moment so these are very important sort of um, elements we need to be aware of before we start talking about something serious one you need also to look children they watch adults they observe they don't say much some of them but they observe very carefully. So they look at your face, look at your body language, the tone of the voice. And based on these clues, they can read whether we are distressed or worried or comfortable. So please be mindful of your own body language. And you need to be really looking very confident and, and relaxed to be able to talk to a child about something serious. So make sure you are aware of that um, and make sure the child is comfortable and relaxed. For, there are times where children are more relaxed than others. For example, when they're having a meal, a family meal or a play time or a reading time, these are times, but not bedtime uh, because bedtime, this is before sleep. We don't want to break sort of the news or talk to the child about something it could be stressful before that. But choose a time where the child is relaxed the child is comfortable. That time is very important. And as, as I said, not bedtime and not in a sort of uh, in the move for safety. And if the child asks a question, say, well, this is a very important question and very clever question. Uh, remind me later and I will come back to you. We'll talk about it um, when we have, let's say, lunch together or when we get home, something like that. So delay it if it's not the right time until you go to a safe place where you can talk about it. How to open the subject? Sometimes people find it hard, what to say to children? How can I start talking about war to children? Sometimes children ask questions themselves um, or they might look very upset. Um, they can hear if they are in a hot conflict zone, they can hear the siren, they can hear the bombing, they can hear you know, they can watch the news, they can hear, they see their parents talking 
and they hear them saying things. So all these are clues will, will make the child feel there is something going on, but they don't know what it is. And they might ask the question. And even if they don't ask the question, I think it is our duty to explain it to them because uh, silence does not mean they're not aware of it. Children are worrying in silence. They worry a lot, but they don't say much. So explaining, giving them information and in, a, in a reassuring way. In a, the main thing is to ensure safety of the child and comfort. And that child can feel it when they see the parent is confident, is relaxed, eating a meal, cooking something nice or playing with them or doing a, a certain activity where the child really enjoys. Then this is a time where you can say, okay, let's talk about that. Let's see. What have you seen today? Or the chat, what, uh, let's go back to the question you asked me earlier. Then you can start talking about uh, what we sort of describe in the situation, what it is. So, um, like I said, it's a fun activity, would be very helpful. Next slide. Okay. The, the way we talk is very important, not just about what we say. And like I said, children are very sensitive and they're very, very clever. They, they really listen carefully, but we don't, uh, and they look at the talk, they kind of listen to the tone of the voice. If, if, you, if you feel anxious, if you feel very worried, uh, then they will sense it immediately and they become very worried. And then whatever you're trying to tell them becomes really difficult. So stay calm. That's the main rule, stay very calm. Uh, Make your child feel calm as well, like I said, through play, through eating, through walking, through doing something uh, together, fun. Ask the child what they know already about what's happening. Yeah, you can ask the child, can you tell me what do you think is happening? What is that? Or they might see a tank, or they might hear an explosion, or they might see something on TV. Say, find out first what exactly they know. And even with small children, they can say in their own way. If, if there is something they have witnessed. Um, and then the child, when they start talking, then you are your time to correct the information. Like I said, the main thing about whatever you're gonna say, you want your child to feel safe. Reassure your child, you are, we are all doing well and we will continue to do well. And I look after you and your, your brothers, your sisters, and we are all safe. And that's reassuring coming out of the body language, about the smile, about the play. That's what you need to make sure. Yes, it is war. You explain war to children because there's no, uh, have to be honest with children. You cannot create a fantasy world to protect them. And it would be in conflict with what they already see. They see things, they hear things, but then you tell them a completely different story that's not going to be helpful for their mental well-being. They need to understand this is a war, uh, and war is bad for all human beings. War is not a good thing, but we are surviving this war, and we're doing well, and we will continue to survive, and you're safe, and we are safe. And that's the message the children need to understand. And of course, it depends on the uh, general question, but the general theme is to make the child feel calm and comfortable and feel safe and protected. And then you can deliver the message. No screaming, no, um, if you feel you're unable to talk because you're overwhelmed with emotions, then don't do it now. Do it when you are actually calm. You don't wanna create a mental uh, sort of uh, distress on your child at a very difficult time. How to respond to the questions? First of course, do not ignore it. There's a question. Uh, do not say you are too young to understand. That's not gonna help. And do not ignore the child's feelings about it. And if you say you're gonna come back to it, then make sure you come back to the question. You do not leave it. So these are really very important things you need to be mindful of when you're talking to children. Um, and as I said earlier, the appropriate time and place is very important because not every place is going to be feeling safe or, or calm. There are certain places the children will feel calm, will feel comfortable, and you'll feel calm as well. 
and then that would give a good message to the child a message of safety and protection because that's what's going on and also understanding their worries when they tell you they're worried about then you can uh, put everything in the right place if they say oh, i'm worried about you mom or dad you're going to die or something will happen bad you can say no we are all safe and we are protected yes there's wars happening out there but we have really you know, your good people are dealing with it. There are so many people in the world now trying to stop it. And, and something like that will reassure the children. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so that we talked about that. The next one. Yeah. That's also discussed. Next, please. And, and it is okay if you do not know the answer. And you might say, it's a very clever question. Let's find the answer together. But you have your own uh, sort of uh, mindful thinking that the eventually you want to deliver a confident, a calm, reassuring, and safe message to children. Of course, older children, they will have a lot of uh, exposure to media, a lot of exposure to uh, social media, and they have more questions. And then the role of the parent or the caregiver to try to direct them to the right sources and explaining there are social media sources might not be very helpful. And this is really important because some sources can create a lot of distress because of fake news, for example or unhelpful news or very graphic news. And this is something need to happen between the child and the parent as a discussion. What would you, what do you see? Where did you hear this from? Can I have a look? But that's of course require a, a relationship, a good relationship with the two, a friendly relationship where children can through this relationship explore more about what's happening. So you're not gonna know all the answers, you're not gonna understand, you know, but you will have the, major framework is to have that discussion with the child and to make sure you explain to them about the sources of information and the harmfulness of exposure to a lot of social media and, and how they can manage it in a way where they can discuss the news with you. You can tell them if there's a source which is a credible source, like can actually uh, provide information and you are uh, and it's a safe source it's not like uh, publishing graphic images of of dead children or destruction then that source could be very useful to to uh, use as a source of, of news and it is not healthy to check the news every day and please you or your children need to understand that and and try not to because this is a major worry in every place, really, in every particular time of war. People want to know everything, want to know it by the minute. There is a, a sort of notification coming from certain apps saying, this is what happened, this is what happened. Stop that. Stop it. It's not going to be helpful and it's not going to be useful and not definitely going to be useful to your children if, if, if it is something they are using. So make sure you just have that discussion with the child and make sure you limit exposure to social media. Next slide, please. So uh, also when you are on the move, when things changing, when school has changed, when the area has changed, when displacement, explain it to children. Don't just drag them with you without knowing what's going on. This leads to a lot of confusion in their mind. And they will create their own scenarios. Children, they will have their own meanings to it. They create a world outside the real world. And some children, they will create a really frightening world. And you don't want that to happen to child. So you always make sure the child is aware of where you're going, where you're moving, and explain it in the same principal way. Protected, safe, we're going somewhere safe. We are all looked after and, and give them a role, whether to take a bag or to do something or to do when you're settled in a new place to do some part of the 
sort of uh, house work, like simple things, but they need to feel they are useful. They are part of this. They're not completely just like a, just moved without explanation. They need to explain to them what's happening. And when you make decisions, sh share it with the children. We are moving now to a different area. We're doing this, we're doing that. We get in a car. This is what we're doing. And the children are part of that process because it does help a lot and helps the family in, uh, as a whole. Uh, next slide, please. And the general rule really, as I said earlier, remain calm because the child is watching you and learning from what they see. Um, be physically close to child. Hugs are really important, very important to hug a child and, and, and physically cl closeness at this time because it gives more comfort, it gives more safety. Um, give the child for attention. Don't get distracted by the news, by other things. There will be so many things to distract you because it's a difficult time, but do not forget the child in the middle of that. And if they worry, if they cry, then please go back to them and ask why and, and comfort them. Do not ignore it. And as I said, find the right place to talk about it. Um, ask and find out where they already know. Then you can correct the information which is not correct and you calm them down if they are scared and make them feel safe. And be honest, be brief, and age appropriate answer. Depends on their age, don't give them answers they don't understand. And then after you finish talking to the child, say, okay, tell me now, what did you understand from our talk? Then you can understand what they understood. Then they tell you, then you know whether they got it right or you need to correct it again. That's a good way of, of finding out. Next slide, please. This is a difficult slide and I, and I can see how difficult it is when you talk about a compassion approach versus prejudice and discrimination. It's natural to hate your enemy. It is natural to feel angry. It is natural to be hatred towards those who want to destruct you, destroy you, destroy your way of life. They, you know, they, they, and, and this is all, of course, part of our human responses and they're all normal feelings. But, and it's a big part really, what is the best for our children? If they became hatred, they became angry, how is it going to help them? Anger is good for soldiers because it gives them power, gives them the energy they need to fight. But is it good for children? Definitely not. Because when we are angry, when we are um, hatred towards a particular group of people, our mind, as I mentioned in the first presentation, is different. Our amygdala is activated. Our stress hormones are released. Do you want this to your children? What are they going to do with it? It's going to create an angry child today because of the war, but tomorrow your mind learned to be angry and it becomes part of life. And this is one of the difficulties at time of war. It creates a lot of difficulties for children afterwards and they become more angry. Violence increases. And, and this is something we don't want to do. So be very careful about when the children talk about hatred towards the enemy, they can label, for example, all Russians are horrible. All Russian people, you could be next door neighbor could be Russian. You could move to the next country and there will be Russian people around. You don't want your child to carry hatred towards everyone. You can, of course, make it uh, sort of um, simpler to the child. Yes, the army, the government, maybe, but, but not to generalize uh, prejudice and discrimination against certain people. And um, this is a difficult one because of, like I said, naturally we feel angry and hatred, but look at the interests of the children. Children, they will not benefit from that. It will hurt them physiologically and mentally. And please be mindful of that. Uh, next slide, please. Um, when you close the talk, when you finish that talk about what's happening, uh, check how the child feels. Is it scared? Is it happy? Is it okay? And check what the child understood. Can you say, explain to me what I've just told you? What is your understanding of it? Do you have any more questions? So that's important as well. Um, and if your child is distressed, 
after the event of the talk, explain why, ask the child why, find out why, and make sure he ended with a calm and confident and safe feeling. That's very important. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a slide about signs of distrust in children. This is for you sort of to look at and, and, and watch for your child. There will be a lot of signs in children when they distress. It depends on the age. So this is a list of the, of course, the younger children were three years old or under, you would notice more behavioral problems, like they become hyperactive or uh, they're not sleeping, they could not be eating, they could be fighting or crying. So you would notice a lot of changes in their behavior. And that tells you the impact of the environment, the news and more is affecting them and you need to pay attention to that. Uh, they are very distressed. The under 13, the same, they become withdrawn, they might not do their activities, they perform poorly in whatever they're doing, whether at school or home taught, uh, irritability, low mood, uh, poor memory, talking about feeling guilty, blaming themselves, all these things can happen to children and there are signs the child is distressed. This is why activity is really important because it can show you all this. If you're not engaged in activity with a child, like drawing or reading or playing, you're not gonna pick up all these things. You're not gonna see it. You're gonna see a quiet child, you think is okay, but they might not be okay at all. And, and the rest of the, the list is, is, you know, is, is very, very clear. Uh, next, please. Anger is normal, fighting with parents are normal, blaming them depends on the older children. They tend to blame, feel guilty, feel responsible. A lot of this feeling can happen and you need to pay attention to it. And also talk about it, talk about it and talk about it. Talk about it to calm them down, to make them feel safe because they are scared. And that's the bottom line. Children are scared and they show it in a different way. They don't tell you are scared. They could tell, you know, they just behave in a way which just shows a high level of stress. Uh, next, please. So how to reduce stress? Uh, as we mentioned earlier, we talked a lot about this part, limit exposure. As I said earlier, limit exposure, we explained that. The next one, please. Activities, find out every day, wherever you are, uh, some sort of activities you do with the children, activities you enjoy and they enjoy. Drawing, playing, reading, art, do it together as a family, bring the family together. And through this, you will learn a lot about the children and you can also pass a lot of the messages you want to pass. Next, please. Teach your children the deep and slow breathing through games. Find a game where it can make them blow candles, for example, slowly and take deep breath because this is a switch for their anxiety and, and make it as a play and it does work and help them to, to do it regularly because it will reduce the level of uh, anxiety and distress. Next. Routine. When you are displaced, you move to a different country, your family is split, the father may be staying behind because he cannot leave the mother and the children somewhere else. There's so much change is gonna happen. Child will lose the routine. They're not going to the same school. They're not doing the same thing. They're not taking the bike outside the, the house. This is all things are different now. So make sure you create a routine for the child. The routine is very important. Routine and role and purpose. These are the things will give that child the structure to channel all the anger and anxiety. Next, please. And that's the role and purpose, as I mentioned earlier. Next one. So the summary here, the child have the right to know what is going on. Uh, children suffer in silence and your responsibility is to protect them from distress. Be honest, brief, age appropriate, Compassion focus information, very important. And avoid words, trigger hatred, anger, and prejudice, because we can do it ourselves without noticing. So in the front of children, please be aware of that. Limit exposure and be calm, be assuring, and close the conversation well, and make sure your child is not distressed at the end of the conversation. 
And before everything else, you make sure you look after and take care of yourself. So that ends uh, next, please. Almost on time with that one. Well, thank you. That's that's the presentation. I think the floor is open for questions now. Dear colleagues, dear participants, please. Uh, the floor is open for questions. Uh, you can write your questions in the chat or ask them. I saw a question in the chat. It's more of a rhetorical question for me, but still, how do you explain to a child that hating aggressors that destroyed their home isn't good how can you explain how can you justify that the child shouldn't be hating them that's a complicated question yeah i mean as i mentioned earlier this is a very difficult one very difficult one because uh, the the safety of the child is paramount is the most important let's say take two scenarios one scenario is the child is going to be hatred and angry towards rightly hatred and rightly angry towards the enemy who's destroying their home and killing their neighbors and bombing their city that's one scenario how is gonna this anger and this hatred how is gonna serve the well-being of the child how is gonna help this child to grow mentally and physically well from my experience from all the evidence available that's not going to help the child even though you think it's right feeling to feel but a child will not have the right frame of mind with this hatred it's not going to help the child mentally or physically eventually you will have a child who's full of hatred and anger and where's going to release this anger what's it going to do with it it's going to lash the anger at home it's going to change his behavior is going to be aggressive child is going to be a child who it could could end up hurting themselves or others or could be a child who will live in silence and this suppression of the anger can show in a different way is this really the best thing we do for the child it doesn't matter how right the anger and hatred is and i see the point and i fully agree with you it's overwhelming not to tell the child to hate your enemy but think of what is best for the child first the child needs to feel safe and protected. I need to feel compassionate about the whole world. I need to see war in a different way than the adults see it. To protect them, not to protect the enemy from the child hatred. The enemy deserves more than that. Deserves every hate you can hate them, but this is not going to be good for the children. I hope this. I, it's a difficult one, but that's the logic behind not you don't need to say don't hate them but you need to focus the child on things like the war war is bad of course we all will hate war okay but when it comes to russian people for example i'm not protecting russians here i'm not really i'm just trying to give you the best uh, sort of our scientific Brilliant. advice in, in the field yeah and and and, and today russian tomorrow could be someone else and and could be next door neighbor from so it, it's ongoing it never ends so it's, it's about thinking, making the child not to be a victim of the war, because the war changes the way we think, changes our feelings. And we need to protect our children from that. We need to be really clear about it and protect them from it. And I'm not saying this is going to be an easy task, but it is an important thing to think about. Thank you. And at this point, I would like to ask our participants, because I'm going to also send you a link to a questionnaire for this uh, today's talks. It will take you less than a minute to complete these questionnaires. And if you have any words of gratitude, would you kindly write them um, with reference to the impressions of to this webinar? And I also have my own personal questions, if Ms. Natalia Shukina may allow me. Could you kindly tell us we as parents, as mothers, sisters, 
now find ourselves here, but our dear husbands are waging a war for our country. Could you kindly tell us how we can, when talking to them, support them? When, while talking to them, you pray to God and make sure that they need to come back alive. And these tears, they just break you. I don't know what kind of words, how can I say that? If there is anything within psychology, a kind of a federal trick that you could teach us because it's extremely difficult for us to communicate with them. It's truly so, thank you. Yeah, I, I can, uh, this is a very difficult one. And, and uh, my heart is, is, is with you on, on every second you are in a call like this. Um, it's important for the whole family, not just the husband and you, everyone to feel the same. War is difficult. We need to accept that. Acceptance is very important. We need to accept separation is, is now happening. So what is left is, is the moral support, is the moral support and support of the connectivity, because this is what will give your husband the energy he needs in, in, in facing the very difficult war they're fighting. And, and the moral support here is the most important one. Uh, the crying is, is natural, the tears are normal, and these are something I wouldn't ask you to suppress because this is real emotion. This emotion this is a reflection of love, of care, reflection of, of worry about the people you love. And these are all beautiful human reactions. We're not gonna ask you to see, find a way to suppress it because let, let it go. That's important. But do not forget yourself in the middle of that. You need also, whatever we said in the uh, initial presentation, the things, um, you know, there are eight things I, I sort of mentioned, please do them. Do as much as you can do because that will control the level of emotion. And the more you control that level of emotion, the better your communication with your husband will be. Your support will be far better for yourself, your children. So your children need you, your husband needs you, the country needs you, a lot of things around you depends on how, you are now the one who's holding everything. And, and, and you need to be looking after yourself. So you take care of yourself and do not look at these things as luxury, the unnecessity. Like if you have a nice meal, if you cook something, if you go out for a walk, do it. Don't think of it, this is too much. Why should I do that while my husband is at war fighting in a shelter or, or, or surrounded by enemy? This is true. But focus, please, like I said, look at the areas where you focus. Focus on your well-being, your children's well-being, and then, of course, that moral support will reach your husband. The more you are in a good shape with your, your family, the better your husband will be, and then you can give a better message to him. So, it's, so that care, please make sure you pay a lot of attention to yourself first. And then, of course, that attention will go around you to the husband and to everyone else and keep connecting if if whatever if you can have it through text messages or calls that connection is very important and if you talk to them just make sure you give them an everyday life scenario you are well reassure them you are well the children well because this is their worry now they they are fighting for you they're fighting to make sure you're okay so make sure you pass this message and contain your emotion a little bit during these calls. Make sure they know you are eating well, you're sleeping well, you are looking after the children and, and the, the, the whole family is, is doing well. This is the news what your husband needs to, to hear and, and keep the communication going. It's, it's very important. Thank you very much indeed on my part. Now, Ms. Natalia. Unless we have any more questions to ask orally, I would like to take this opportunity to say a few words from myself with reference to the presentation, with reference to resilience and shaping uh, mental resilience. You have provided a wonderful quote by Darwin. In my day, I also suffered from a difficult period, just like everyone of us has to go through that. And I was given a book to read by Viktor Frankl, 
This is an Austrian psychiatrist, Shrink. And for a long time, he stayed in a concentration camp during the Second World War. And his quote, I would like to read it to you now. Victor Frankl wrote in his book after the liberation from the concentration camp, the first to break down were those who believed that soon things will be over. Next, those who didn't believe that this, will, oh, this would finish one day, and only those managed to survive who focused and concentrated on their deeds without expecting or awaiting of what may happen. What else may happen? This is what the doctor said about take care of yourselves, be mindful of yourselves in the first place. And we set an example to others, our resilience and the stress. Dear Dr. Dumad, we sincerely thank you. We thank you from the bottom of our heart for your communication with our judges, justices, uh, court staff, and all those who were willing to participate in today's event, participate in today's webinar and to hear your talks. We are grateful to you for your practical and deep advice, which have already worked in numerous countries. You have shared in our working meeting, meeting with us that two weeks ago you were in Iraq, um, to communicate and to provide advice to Iraqi judges and justices. That is to say that your technique with reference to psychological and mental resilience have already been tried and tested on other people. And of course, they result in positive effects. Duly, in a necessary way, was extremely needed for us to hear your mechanisms, the mechanisms that you have to offer in order for us to shape mechanisms of resilience within people. However, today, we also, we, we still perceive it at a theoretical level. We still need to make sure that all of these mechanisms are experienced by ourselves. We need to let them go through our awareness, consciousness, and to learn to use them both as advice at a physical level when you said that meditation, um, when you spoke about calming ourselves down and closing our eyes and uh, aligning proper thinking, which is definitely going to be extremely helpful to us. We wish you strong health. We wish you every success and all the best. Please continue carrying your knowledge, your experience. Keep teaching people for them to feel uh, life in a much easier way, especially when they find themselves and the condition of turmoil that the Ukrainian nation finds itself in. And I very much like the expression, we need to live in order to live. And I wish all of us every success, all the best, peace and light, peaceful sky above our hands to each and everyone living in, in, this, in this world. Now, Miserina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed as well. It's also difficult for me to contain all of my emotions. In the first place, I would like to thank dear Dr. Saleh Dumad for his sincerity, frankness, and for his geniality and readiness to help. In addition, I would also like to express my gratitude to all of our participants for joining us, for sending their wishes and saying that this information has been truly useful to them and helpful. I would like to wish all of us, irrespective of the countries that we find ourselves in, I want to wish us peace, victory, and of course, to have an opportunity to hug and embrace all of our nearest and dearest who are right now in the state of war. I beg your pardon, I'm a strong individual, but anyway, I cannot help myself. It's been really useful for me to hear what's already been said today, that the way that you take care of yourself will be mirrored and reflected in our communication with our nearest and dearest for right now waging a war. One more thing to mention. Once again, there is a link in the chat box for the questionnaire. Please make sure you fill it out. And one more thing to mention such a webinar is just the first in the series of webinars. And we are thinking of holding with Dr. Dumad a similar 
webinar for mediators from the free legal aid system and another webinar for the Ukrainian lawyers and attorneys. If you have any such acquaintances and mates that work in such environments and setting, could you kindly inform them that on the 27th of April, this is going to be meant for the Ukrainian lawyers and solicitors, and on the 29th, it will be for the free legal aid uh, workers and mediators. I've already uh, sent a link to link for that in the chat box. I'm going to ask Anton, our IT specialist, to provide the QR code for this questionnaire forms. And before he does it, again, I embrace and hug you all. I wish you peace and victory, every good and every benefit to us. And of course, I would like to thank our two interpreters, two Helenas, who have been helping us today to communicate and to understand and contain our emotions. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye, peace and well-being to us all. Take care. All the best. Thank you very much.